Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to the podcast as we move around the body from head to toe. My name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager and librarian. And I'm Olivia Howe and I'm a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we've got as far as fat. So I guess we should start off by saying there is fat in the sense of the literal connective tissue in your body. There's fat in the sense of being fat or being overweight. And there is fat in the sense of the thing that you eat or you cook with. Should we start by doing a bit of a timeline, I suppose, of of changing attitudes to fatness? As I sort of understand it from the research that I've done, understandably, there's quite a long time where being fat is generally viewed as a positive thing. So we're really talking up to maybe the 1400s, maybe the 1500s even, where, you know, we're talking about sort of real scarcity of access to food. We're talking about famines and very seasonal access to resources. And as a result of that, being overweight is generally associated with wealth and power and status, particularly for men, but for women as well. Now, we're generally not talking about real extremes of overweightness. Um, That's very, very rare. But having fat on your body is generally a sort of sign of status. Logically, it makes sense. You have money, you can afford things all year round. And then there is a shift that happens. And it feels like a story, there's many, many different versions of what that shift comes from. So it comes from a growth in the middle classes. It comes from international sort of connections that allow for importation into Europe of sugar and things that would kind of increase your fat. And we're also talking about an increase in a sedentary lifestyle of the middle classes, not of absolutely everyone. So Lots of things come together that kind of in the 1600s, but particularly in the 1700s, mean that being fat shifts and it becomes something negative. It was interesting. I I kind of assumed that there would be like a, it is good, it is now bad, but it was a lot more nuanced than I thought. Plumpness was the word I found as being like the positive form of fatness. You want to be plump because that um, shows that you are getting all the nutrients you need. You are sturdy and healthy and robust enough to do the work that you have to do. But then corpulence was the excessive overweight. The word corpulence makes me icky. I think it's um, because you call pigs corpulent and then it's like the linguistic link. It, It feels like, although there's an implication that corpulence is sort of slightly large and then obese is bigger, Nobody ever quantifies that. So it ends up feeling like it's much more of a societal judgment. Middle class people or respectable people or or people that you like seem to be corpulent and people who are bad people or lower class or lazy or whatever are obese. But it's not a scientific definition. It's a cultural one, right? Mm. Just on the other end of the spectrum, the, the article I was reading said that there was um, also a difference between leanness, which was valued in being lean was good, but being gaunt was bad. And there was not anything I could find that would medically distinguish between the two states. Yes, it it feels like with our kind of 21st century brains with the kind of BMI index and all these sorts of things, we want them to be saying something as you say, objective and scientific. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I read, it was saying that around 
the turn of the 20th century when medicine could be perceived as extending life rather than preventing illness and people were getting life insurance and it was the life insurance companies needing to set numbers on things. Oh, if you are this weight, we can offer you this much money. If you are less, then we can offer you more. So that was interesting. Uh, I didn't have a chance to fact check this. So this is from one reasonably respectable website. Um, King Sancho I of Leon was deposed from his throne because he was morbidly obese and that kept him from riding a horse or wielding a sword or bedding his wife or walking properly. He reportedly weighed over 350 pounds. He fled to his grandmother's kingdom after he was deposed and his grandmother asked for help from the Sultan of Cordoba, um, who sent his Jewish physician, who was the chief advisor of his court, to help this very large king. And he reportedly sewed his mouth shut, fed him on opium and herbs, and massaged his body. And that worked. King Sancho retook his throne in 960 CE. I'm going to have to circle back to <laughs> sewing his mouth, his mouth shut. Mm. Um, if nothing else, standards of hygiene at the time. And maybe I don't even want to know the answer to the, my, the question that I was going to ask, but that, that upsets me and I'd like to register that. <laughs> yeah. I Maybe that's one that we don't investigate. <laughs> a, a separate anecdote that might be slightly less upsetting, perhaps, Mm -hmm. um, so William Ward was an English surgeon and he was like very, very high profile. So he's like personal physician to the king and, and had lots of sort of high profile gigs. Is that the way you describe it? So this is in the 1700s. <laughs> and so he was one of the first who talked about the obesity versus corpulence sort of, you know, situation. And his book comments on corpulency, I would recommend because the illustrations in it are fantastic and it has what you were talking about Olivia of illustrations of sort of extremely corpulent because he had a very particular audience he was targeting and it was only the corpulent who were going to buy his book not the obese but he also has pictures of people who were very lean not gaunt again aware of his target audience so he wants to go for the wealthy people who can afford to buy books so those are the lean people um but he talks about his experience both with his own corpulency but also treating patients who are corpulent and he gives various case studies and there's a fantastic case study of a countess who was so corpulent that she spontaneously combusted. <laughs> Just... We've talked about spontaneous combustion before. But yeah, you could be so corpulent that you would be, as he said, reduced to ashes from your corpulency. So this is the sort of level of scientific rigorousy which we're talking about here. Given that he is essentially selling a product, his book is, you know, how to treat this. You need to follow my suggestions. You need to buy this book or you may explode, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And I, another one, actually, when we're going of kind of high profile case studies, another sort of big advocate for, for dieting and extreme weight loss technology was John Harvey Kellogg of serial fame. But in his sanitarium, I think he called it his sort of institute, which was sort of a strange mix of like a health club and, and a hospital and, and a bunch of other things. One of the things that he advocated were what he called electrotherapeutic couches. It's one of those electricity will cure everything scenarios. Very much the era of the peak of electricity. And I think there is, you know, for people like Kellogg, you know, these kind of people who, who set up these sort of slightly strange institutes or, or centres or what have you, it was sort of throwing everything at a wall to see what stuck sort of air of it, of try literally every new innovation, every sort of idea was given a go. It's interesting, like terms like overweight and underweight, uh, more modern ones, where there's, there's seen to be an ideal weight that you can be. 
So certainly the Victorians, you know, we've talked about before when we're talking about the eyes and the ears, you know, that there is this idea of there's a normal way for the body to be. The Victorians are very big on convention, being normal, fitting in, you know, there being a way that things are done. And so, you know, anything that smacks of perhaps lacking that sort of rigour and and normality, and again, lots of inverted commas around that word but there is definitely a sort of a correct structure to how things are done and being obese is viewed as sort of deviant from that (laughs) so i don't suppose that you have heard of sarah bartman at all i have vaguely but not in any detail so she was a Khoisan woman born in 1789 in South Africa, and she worked on Dutch farms and then moved to Cape Town, where she was a washerwoman and a nursemaid. But her employer started showing her at the city hospital in exchange for money because she had something called steatopigia, I'm going to say that wrong, which is a genetic buildup of fat in your buttocks and thighs that give your body a totally different shape to what is expected in or was expected in Western norms at the time. It makes your bum at 90 degrees to your body, more or less. But yes, so she was uh, convinced by her employer and a Scottish surgeon at the city hospital to travel to Europe and they displayed her as an exhibition piece under the name Hot and Toe Venus. Hot and Toe being like a really now very derogatory word for the Kokoi people. She wasn't just a novelty in terms of Western beauty standards, but she became of scientific interest because of this difference in how her body fat was distributed. So when she died, they put her skeleton and her body cast on display. And it wasn't until 1974 that it was taken down and not until 2002 that it was repatriated and given burial. It's always more recent than you wish it was when you have dates Mm. like that. We've got a folder in uh, the college's library that I was looking at recently. I hadn't been aware that we had. We have over 70,000 books. I'm allowed to not know every (laughs) single one of them. But it's a bound volume of essentially posters for sideshows, you know, for those sorts of... It's basically a sort of snapshot of the medical conditions that people wanted to stare at. I don't know what that says about that particular sort of era of people. In today's case study, we're going to look at the physician George Cheney, his personal struggles with his weight, and the weight loss remedies he recommended. Cheney was born in 1671 in Aberdeenshire. He studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh before moving to London, where he set up a private medical practice. Cheney wrote a number of books relating to weight loss and mental health. His works took a very self-help approach, giving guidance on diet and exercise to his readers. And he wasn't writing as the great philosopher in his ivory tower, for Cheney himself struggled greatly with his weight. It was quite common for physicians who moved in well-heeled circles to meet their patients in taverns, dining rooms and coffee houses. The menu which survives from one of the dinners he attended at the home of Lady Betty Hastings in the 1720s included almond soup, boiled pike, battered rabbit, calf's foot pie a breast of veal, tongue, goose, chicken, sheep, gravy soup and salmon, and that's not even considering the alcohol and the desserts. The only vegetable served at this meal was a side dish of cabbage. And, according to Cheney himself, he, quote, grew daily in bulk with his bottle companions, the younger gentry and the free livers, nothing being necessary for that purpose but to be able to eat lustily and swallow down much liquor. Cheney said that he soon found himself, quote, fat, short-breathed, lethargic and lifeless. Cheney attempted a range of diets. In 1707, he decided to only eat milk and vegetables. This helped Cheney to lose weight, but as soon as he returned to a more balanced diet, he gained weight again. Cheney then returned to his restricted diet, 
and remain for the rest of his life a vegetarian and a proponent of vegetarianism to his patients and to the readers of his books. At this point, around 1720, Cheney established a medical practice in the spa town of Bath. He moved away from his indulgent youth in England's capital, and instead he began to write, to share his healthy living tips in print. Cheney's most celebrated book was Essay of Health and Long Life, published in 1724. In it, he emphasised the importance of diet, exercise, rest and fresh air. Red meat was to be avoided, as was any food which was smoked, spiced or pickled. Exercise was key, although unsurprisingly given the social class of his clientele, he focused particularly on hunting, shooting, billiards, fencing, dancing and horse riding. In this short excerpt, Dr. James Kennaway explores Georgian weight gain and understanding the class divide in the gaining of weight. In the Georgian period, it's almost universally believed that the rich die young and the working poor have healthy lives. Just to give one example of really thousands, James Mackenzie's History of Health in 1765 advocated exercise and gentle physics, physic for the overfed rich but said that the poor have great advantages over the rich with respect to health and long life as the narrowness of their circumstances prompts them to labor and withdraws uh, all temptations to luxury. As I said, I could quote a million examples of that. Uh, There was one, however, big uh, drawback with this kind of gluttony uh, and very unfashionable one. I found three different cases of uh, serious doctors... um, giving examples of spontaneous human combustion caused by uh, (coughs) flatulence brought on by um, eating overeating. James McKittrick Adair, who wrote a very famous essay on fashionable diseases, wrote in another book his philosophical and medical sketch of the natural history of human body and mind, that in a woman dissected by Rausch, the famous Dutch um, anatomist, a vapor issuing from the stomach caught fire when a candle was brought near to it. In dram drinkers, the breath is said to take fire sometimes, and an Italian countess is said to have been totally consumed, one hand accepted, in consequence of drinking an orderly of spirit of wine. Combined with electric fluid in the bodies, gastric vapor had led to the death of another Italian lady and consumed a considerable part of her body to ashes. And William Wadd, who I mentioned at the, moment, at the beginning, gives another example of a French lady whose fat caught fire. Not altogether fashionable. There is, however, some debate about this, but I think you can make an argument that after 1800 or so, you start to get a shift away from the association of gluttony with just the elite, and you start to get the idea that um, the uh, stomach complaints of various kinds uh, could also be associated with the middling sort, with business people. Uh, so Thomas Trotter, almost everybody I'm going to quote is Scottish, but that's not out of uh, patriotic fervor or something. It's... Um, reflects the nature of the subject. Uh, Thomas Trotter, in his book, The View of the Nervous Temperament, 1807, suggested that the lifestyle of men of business impedes the functions of the stomach, uh, and gives a long explanation of how that would work. So it's for Cheney, he's really talking about the idle rich, the English malady is something for the idle rich. But with Trotter already, we've got something a bit like the executive ulcer, which I remember even when I was young was quite a big deal, and it sort of disappeared in a puff of smoke in some ways. Um, On a slightly different note, James Johnson, who was the personal physician to William IV, wrote in his essay on the morbid sensibility of the stomach and bowels in 1831, that this class of stomach and bowel complaints knocks at the door of every gradation of society, from the monarch in his splendid palace down to the squalid inhabitant of St. Giles or Saffron Hill, the worst slums in London, whose exterior exhales the effluvium of filth and interior that of inebriating portations. Um, There's not much evidence that the the poor are drinking more than the rich. So he's suggesting not that it's something for the middling sort, that it affects everybody. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. 
Recipes relating to a person's weight could be both to lose weight and to gain it, to help with too much appetite and too little. One recipe from a book titled Poor Man's Physician to help treat a lean body, or that is to gain weight, quote, If young bleed yearly, if old drink chocolate or coffee instead of tea, or any of the twain by eating figs and drinking their juice. Another recipe from the same book, this time for what it calls a greedy appetite, included, quote, Pottage of wheat and a little whale oil boiled therewith. Repeat this once a day for three days, or apply gum arabic to the belly. If none of these will cure, the patient's case must be desperate indeed. Another 1700s text, titled Taylor's Ready Doctor, contains a number of treatments for a weak appetite. That includes, quote, take a preserved pear with sugar, or a preserved or roasted pippin, and so eat it. Also prunes with white wine and rose water, a rose cake steeped in rose vinegar laid to the stomach and removed before it grows hot. The use of turpentine is good because it cleanseth the bowels. One ounce of the syrup of wormwood drunk. Claret water is usual. Powder made of two parts of sugar and one of cinnamon. Pepper eaten. Gooseberries, sloes, mustard. All these restore the appetite. Hippocrates' counsel is to travel before meat, to drink water, and to refrain from sleep. The stone of sapphire, jasper, or diamond stones bound to the arm or worn and carried upon them. And, in the same text, the cure for insatiable hunger, or what it also calls dog's hunger, is, quote, fat broth supped, bread steeped in thick sweet wine eaten, rice made ready with a good quantity of milk, eating of the tail, feet, and other extreme parts of eatable beasts, wine plentifully taken, all fat things, and um, and honestly, at this point, I can't tell if it says fat things and owls, or fat things and oils. It really does look like it says owls, but that does seem unlikely, so we're going to go with all fat things and oils. Six grains of ambergris taken in a raw egg. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.